Um, that's my theme, and uh, as you can see, it's quite uh, ambitious. Before I start, though, I just want to say that uh, today, uh, my wife and I are married 33 years today. And, uh, <laughs> but unfortunately, the marriage has come under great threat in the last few years. No, no in the last uh, year, since I got my uh, iPhone. Um, but we're hanging in there, and we're getting some counselling on how to deal with a long-term marriage and an iPhone. Uh, as a contribution to uh, the stability of the marriage, I actually left my iPhone at home, so I'm almost completely naked. And that means that instead of looking at my iPhone to find out how the weather is, I've been forced to look out the window to see whether it's raining or not. Because normally I can just lie in bed and see whether it's raining on my Apple uh, weather. The other great thing about an iPhone is that at meetings, most of which are incredibly boring, I can track the International Space Station through my app. And at any time, I can tell people where the International Space Station is. Now, I have to tell you, not a lot of people want to know where the International Space Station is. And I just think having that information just makes it fantastically interesting. So I can do all of those things through my little iPhone, and I guess what I, what I just have fallen in love with, and I hope everybody falls in love with, is just the fantastic world of technology that we currently live in. It is just amazing. Just three quick examples of some of the stuff that's going on in a couple of the universities <coughs> around uh, Australia at the moment. Uh, people have, in one the university, have built a virtual space station. It is so good that NASA has actually contracted with them because some of the things that NASA has seen on their space station, they want to incorporate. <laughs> other people have built uh, virtual islands for environmental work and other people are doing uh, virtual uh, court work. So it is just a fantastic revolution of uh, technology. But what is just most amazing to me, and I'm getting counselling about this, so anybody here that's a good social worker can help with you know, people who are stuck, what I don't understand is why we've got this and we continue to use these sorts of things as our primary mode of teaching and learning and education in the very places where we're supposed to be at the cutting edge of information and technology, the universities are just awful. Overall, now I don't know, you might come back to me, but where I work, <coughs> some of my colleagues think chalk is an incredibly innovative invention. So, it's just an amazing thing that when you think about the world that we live in, and it's not a revolution that has been uh, slow, it's been a revolution really in the last decade. Right? If, if we could, you could all go back and later on in this, I'll, we could all go back to what we started out with our first computer, this, that, and the other. And the things we take for granted now are things that 10 years ago we hadn't heard of in the main. So it is a fantastic revolution that we've seen. And ICTs are now not only obviously in relation to education, <coughs> but they are at the very heart of most of the things that we now do on the planet. We could not have had the global financial meltdown without it was brought to us by our contemporary ICTs. We couldn't have done that. And it's brought us great things like Fox News, fair and impartial. Um, and it is a, it's not a revolution, eh? it's an ongoing evolution. And we, God knows where we're likely to be in the next few years. So, I, we get this, no? there's some key resources, key information there, and this, uh, I hate statistics because I never really understand it, but this is fantastic. This comes from Google, uh, from YouTube. Type in, did you know, an unbelievably great little video. But look at the sorts of things it says. If Facebook was a country, it would be one of the, it'll be nearest to the fourth largest country in the world. The social networking uh, uh, site in uh, China has a minimum of 200 million. Nobody quite knows. YouTube, 120 million videos. What fantastic resources that are available. And sometimes, you know, like, I just cry at the university because people say, is it referenced properly? You know, and then you think, I don't care. What I really want people to do is to get stuck into this. We'll worry about the referencing later on, right? Get stuck into all of this fantastic, because it's transformed information. It has absolutely given us all of these things at our fingertips. 
And in addition to that, what we got, or what I think we're we're now <coughs> is that a lot of this is coming together in the thing that I've left at home. It's coming together in our mobile phones, in convergent technologies, which are giving us all sorts of possibilities. And given that we ought to be thinking about both present and future, look at that. This is these trends in the in the younger generation. I'm not into you know older, younger, all that sort of thing. But there is no doubt that folk down here are telling us what they're going to be wanting to learn, how they're wanting to work, etc., etc., etc. That's going to come all down. Now, most of us in this room are more than appreciative of this, and we're more than appreciative that what we now live in is a converged world, where the information, the communication, and I have to say, we don't give enough attention to how we present our information and how to present our knowledge, but those things have all come together in this ICT revolution. <coughs> Well, so what, you ask a good question. What we've done in our university, and I just want to make three quick points. What we've done is we really have gone out <coughs> with our new master's course in social work education, in social work. And we have basically thrown every piece of technology that we can at the delivery of this uh, particular degree. And I'll flip back between these two sites, but we actually do use most of these things, not these, uh, these things here, but certainly RSS and iGoogle. We use Facebook, MySpace, we use most of those, and we use most of those. And what we've done is fundamentally this. We've tried to integrate these technologies in a way that really have changed our understandings of space and place and time. And what that really means is that We've tried to build a blended environment that gets away from about 7,000 years old. You have to come to a place in order to learn. What we've tried to say is, no, you don't have to come to that place. This is rewritten the way we can get people to envisage space and time, because, as you know, they can, they can do things whenever, as at their, at their convenience. One of the big issues for universities is trying to synchronise the money that is now being spent on the physical and the money that is now being spent on the virtual and what is the blend between those two in terms of underpinning the learning and teaching modes. The, you know, if anybody ever says to me again, face to face, I will truly scream. I've made a resolution early today. If they say to me face to face, I love face to face. No, it's not. I keep saying, no, it's, not. it's you and people sitting up there Half of them are asleep, three quarters of them are then rehearsing an argument, four tenths are trying to work out what they'll have for dinner, and the rest of them are texting or they've got all sorts. So we've got lots of myths, haven't we, about face to face. I love face to face. It's just not, it, it's a myth. So what we've tried to do here is to say we've got a whole range of ways to interface with people. And very truly, we've tried to do this blended and collaborative environment. And a couple of interesting things that, um, that <coughs> I might refer to. One is, um, just leave that for a minute. One is, we use a lot of free stuff. We use Google Video, Google Voice, Skype, and we probably saved about 700 trips to the university so far. We've also been able to get very close relationships with quite a lot of students because we're talking to them, actually talking to them face to face by using Google Video and Google Chat. Very simple, very cheap, very effective. You don't need to spend a great deal of money to get everybody up and running on that. Interesting sorts of things. We've had to tell people we do need a dress code, right? Because it, it's been one of the things that's thrown us when we are talking to people on Skype or on Google Video, we have to say, could everybody be dressed? Could you keep the arguments down in the background? and you know, try to keep people from running backwards and forwards in the camera. But it's been a really lovely, intimate experience with students, platformed off a very simple, user-friendly piece of technology. And we've done that because we wanted to be able to uh, have things that are really at people's uh, disposal. We've also been able to integrate a great deal of real-world learning into our teaching. Because we, part of our assessments now are people contributing to pub, public roles. So instead of writing some academic piece of work which only three or four people will read, students are required to participate in public roles. People are required to participate in social networks, <coughs> asking people to
to use Facebook as platforms of social activism, to invite other people not in the course, etc., etc. So we've thrown a whole range of these new technologies or emerging technologies at the teaching and the learning of the master's degree. And I'm happy to talk much more about that as we go along. We've only been running it, this is only in the first six months of the course, but it really means that students do not have to come to the university. We do not use the term distance education. We don't use the term virtual. We sort of use the term blended, but we try to get away from those sorts of modes of things. And just two other quick things. We could. There is no reason why we can't break down a lot of the isolation that we have in the way we educate. I can think of a much better use of avatars than the movie in the way we could build communities of practice between us globally. I can think of all sorts of ways in which we can use these ordinary social networking sites. We use Facebook, for example, in a lot of the human rights teaching so that they invite people who may be involved, even like female genital mutilation, child brides, child <coughs> soldiers, all of those sorts of things. Students can access people actually working on those issues right now through these sorts of sites, through integrating into the social networking, through the blogs, for public forums and those sort of things. And it's an unbelievably enriching experience for the student because they're accessing that wealth of real world uh, information. As I've said before, we also uh, and try to get students to be able to talk to activists, to educators, to a whole range of people. In other words, this has broken open the numbers of people that can be involved in our educational experience. We don't have to invite somebody to come to the university because the experts, the practitioners <coughs> are all there at our disposal if we're able to use that effectively. Just two quick points. Social work is not just, it's not a limited thing, it's, it's about human rights, it's about social justice. And I have absolutely no doubt there's been reference made to the Millennium Development Goals. One of the key things for gender equality, for the empowerment of women, laid down in the Millennium Development Goals, is that if women and young girls do not have access to ICTs, they will be at great peril of being further excluded as the revolution goes along. So there's a real role. Social work profession must embrace technologies because we must model that and enable people to access that because it is an absolutely fundamental instrument to empowerment and to the furthering of gender equality. <coughs> The other thing is that the days that if the technologies play an extraordinary role in human rights activism. I saw the video of the Israelis boarding the boat for the Gaza blockade within 30 minutes of the boarding because I was following it on Twitter. And a few other people, and that we were able to engage. We didn't do a great deal, but we were able to engage in the sorts of activism that brings these things to people's attention. So the technologies, as you well know, I'm not telling you anything new, but as you well know, these technologies are critically important for the gender equality issue, empowerment, critically important for when people are in real danger, critically important for being able to take effective action for those. And many organisations like Amnesty Human Rights Watch and many others that you know are beginning and have been incorporating those things into them. So I just think we, we, we have a fabulously rich technological environment and I think there's a real role for us to be able to say to people the days of this being an optional exercise are over. If we want social work to be right in the middle of the main game then we have to embrace the role of ICTs within that game and within the furthering of social justice in the